I am breaking silence again because I know now that this really truly is a systemic issue. My case is a window into something that is happening, particularly to, according to the occult expert, religious sisters. Catholics really need to wake up about the, the reality that our church has been infiltrated by her enemies. Satanic ritual abuse covered up in the Catholic Church? Really? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You might remember a couple of years ago, Rachel Master Giacomo made the circuit. And, uh, well, you know, the story is not completely told. There's still more under the surface that still has to come out. We'll talk about that at 30 past the hour. So satanic ritual abuse at the hands of Catholic priests. Is there a network there? That's one of the questions. I want you to be thinking about Mark Rubnick right now. By the way, my name is Joe McLean. I host a radio program called A Catholic Take, where we look at the world through a Catholic lens. I'd love for you to hang out with us. If you like it, give it a thumbs up and let us know what you think in the comments below. Joining us right now, praise be to God, is Rachel Master Giacomo. Give us the background here. How long ago was what happened to you? When did that happen to you? Where were you? What were the circumstances? And who was the priest involved? Yeah, so nearly 15 years ago, um, I moved to Rome on a vocational pilgrimage. I was open to religious life. Uh, I had just graduated from Franciscan University at Steubenville. I did about a year of youth ministry, and then I moved to Rome um, to just lay myself before our blessed Lord and beg him for um, clarity as far as my vocation. While I was in Rome, I was exposed uh, to a very dark predator, um, a very sadistic predator, and one who my exorcist, and I believe, was a Satanist before he entered seminary. Um, wow. His name is Father Jacob, Father Jacob Bertrand uh, from, the, from the Diocese of San Diego. He's no longer in active ministry. He's been uh, defrocked and laicized as a canonical penalty. I took him to court, um, and he was convicted of, of raping me um, within the context of the holy sacrifice of the Mass. That is um, that is hard to really grasp. Right? What you just said. He was a he was a Satanist before he enters enters into seminary. There are many priests who are continuing to act and behave in this way. Clergy members in high offices, even, and they seem to get a pass and even covered up. And that was an element in your story. It seems like folks kind of knew that this was going down, and still they didn't do much about it. Yeah, you know, Joe, it's it's kind of crazy. Um, after he was convicted and sentenced, and then he became a registered predatory offender, um, believe it or not, it was reported in the Wall Street Journal that Bishop McElroy had covered up the satanic ritual abuse. Now, um, they didn't call it satanic ritual abuse. Uh, since everything blew up in the, no in the news, I ended up working with a, an exorcist who was an occult expert and was able to diagnose my case. And so now I'm able to, st to say with firm conviction um, that this was uh, grooming for a satanic black mass, that I was being wow. recruited um, to be, yes, a high priestess. I was being pushed toward religious life. Um, but this satanic black mass, we believe, would have served as an entry point into the occult, and I was being targeted and recruited to be almost like a queen bee um, or a high priestess in a coven, um, and it was it was unfortunately um, we believe going to be a huge weapon against Holy Mother Church. Praise be Jesus Christ! It was brought down, um, but Amen yeah, McElroy he was. Promoted. He was promoted to the Red Hat despite his cover-up of satanic ritual abuse. And um, this is all documented in the Wall Street Journal. Can we go back to the satanic element for a moment, Rachel? So what can you maybe just share, set some light, exactly what were those elements that led your, your exorcist to believe that something much more nefarious, much more dark than just simple uh, a, a sexual pervert abusing the, the, the uh, office of the clergy to take advantage of a victim? Well, like how was, what was satanic about it? Yes, so the details themselves are... Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going back and forth about whether or not I share this. Uh, the reason why I might share the details pertaining to the ritualistic formula 
are because I'm aware that other women, particularly religious sisters, are being targeted, systematically targeted for this particular ritualistic formula. Um, this is the gravest sacrilege blasphemy committed against the Holy Eucharist people. Um, in fact, it's so grave that um, in the past, I've not felt comfortable, nor has those reported on my story felt comfortable discussing those details and precisely what my ritual abuser uh, was doing within the context of the Holy mm. Sacrifice of the Mass, particular, particularly to the Holy Eucharist, and also um, to my body. It's very, very essential for this particular ritual that the, the, the victim, the female victim, is a virgin. This is crucial. In fact, had I not been a virgin, I wouldn't have been targeted for this particular um, for this particular ritual. But what I'm aware of now is the fact that um, this ritualistic for formula is easily identifiable, especially to those who are, you know, well versed in the occult and exorcism ministry. And I was recently provided with an interview uh, by an investigator who spoke with the top lay person in the world when it comes to spiritual warfare. Mm. And the investigator disclosed some of these details pertaining to my ritual abuse. And the occult expert immediately identified the ritual, said this is a very specific ritual formula. And he said, it's consistent with what they're seeing. This is happening. He said they're going after Catholic nuns. He wow. also verified that this particular ritual had been done at the North American College and elsewhere. Wow. Now I was I was um, not studying at the North American College. I was studying at the Angelicum, but exposed to many seminarians and priests at the North American College when I was targeted for this particular satanic ritual. You know, NAC has a reputation. A lot of you know, a lot of priests are sent there. If they think they have great potential, they are bishop material. You know, they send them off to the NAC, and um, and a lot of those men actually get on that trajectory, and they end up with a uh, with becoming bishops or even some of them red hats, et cetera, et cetera. So nobody wants to think badly about places like the NAC, and yet this is the place that you find uh, the wolf hiding in the in the in the shadows so to speak and i gotta ask the question because there's a lot of people probably wondering and it's something you've talked about a number of times in the past how do you get suckered in i, I use that only to just sort of set this up in a way that you can help people better understand the level of psychological trauma that has to happen here how do you get convinced to participate in a perverse liturgy the one that you've you've suffered. how do you, how does that even happen, Rachel? Well, because it happened to me, I know firsthand the methods, the highly calculated grooming. I mean, the grooming process in my case took ten months, and um, it was completely uh, cloaked in Catholic mysticism, theology of the body, bridal theology, the lives of the saints. Um, song of songs. I can see why Catholic nuns might fall for this type of predation because they identify, their identity is bride of Christ. See, I was being pushed toward religious life by a number of um, priests, seminarians, at the time that I was being specifically primed for this particular satanic ritual, um, a satanic black mass. And it was all under the guise of me being so holy, so pure. In fact, I had really been living deeply into a life of chastity and I didn't struggle at all with any kind of sexual immorality or sin at the time that I was being targeted for this. And um, so when my abuser told me that I was so chaste, so pure, that I was called to something even greater, a mysticism beyond you know, even that that we see in the lives of the saints, this is a secret. I mean, it was very Gnostic. It was very mm. Gnostic, but he was preparing me for this secret ritual in which I would be married to Jesus Christ and would reach spiritual perfection and transforming union. 
So I can see how a religious sister, for instance, might slowly be seduced into this, not in a sexual way, but um, in, a, in a Gnostic, occult-related way, uh, because all she wants to give her life to is Christ Jesus and to be to be a saint and to be um, in transforming union with God. So that's all the weapons that, I mean, and these are not weapons, these are beautiful holy things, but they were weaponized by a very satanic predator in my case. And I did want to mention too, when I was going through deliverance with an incredibly holy exorcist, um, I was I was actually not delivered from any demons of sexuality. I was oppressed, highly oppressed by several very high ranking occult demons and demons of witchcraft, all because of my exposure to this Catholic priest. I've never done yoga or a Ouija board in my life. And so the, the level of spiritual combat to which I was um, invited to wage war, thanks be to Jesus Christ, I was, I was totally liberated. On, uh, to the solemnity. Yes, Our Lady, Mary, I mean, if I have anything to proclaim, it's Mary. And yeah. Jesus Christ truly is Lord. And he He goes after the one lost sheep and he went after me. And so I want to bring a message of hope. So there was the priest that actually did abuse you. But wasn't there another, like a, like a, a spiritual director involved of sorts that you thought might have been cooperative in the process? Yes. Prior to my abuser... Becoming my spiritual director, I had a, an original spiritual director in Rome who um, kind of laid the groundwork uh, for the abuse that eventually took place. I cannot prove whether or not he's involved, whether he was intentionally priming me for satanic ritual abuse, but um, many investigators have been very concerned and um, there are still many unanswered questions, but um, things pointing to a particularly um, frightening conclusion that I was essentially being targeted by a group. A group, let that sink in for a second. And this priest, I remember listening to the interview you did with Dr. Jennifer Roback Morris from the Ruth Institute. Great interview, by the way. You talked about why you had you basically had a difficult choice to make. Do you do you try to get this man into jail or do you try to get this man to just admit his crime? Because he didn't just try to manipulate you. He manipulated your your family. He manipulated your friends. This guy, this guy wanted to control every aspect of your life, it seems. Tell me about that. Yes, he absolutely did. Sadistic, satanic, narcissistic predators such as these groom entire communities surrounding the victim. And that happened in my case. And I did want to mention that throughout the criminal procedure, one particular priest who's actually becoming quite popular, his name's Father John Burns. Mm. He was very protective of my abuser. He showed public allegiance to Father Jacob Bertrand after Bertrand had been criminally charged with rape. And the satanic details had actually started to come out in the news. This was in October of 2016. And then Burns showed a public sign of allegiance to Bertrand the following January when they went vacationing in Puerto Vallarta. And um, during the criminal procedure, Father John Burns' sister Mary and his friend Elizabeth Repka actually participated in helping Jacob Bertrand by working with his defense attorneys and providing statements. Some wow. of the statements were defamatory, and these statements were thrown in my face right before trial, and it scared the you-know-what out of me. I can imagine. And when I was, yes, I felt bullied into the plea agreement. And we had everything we had. The man should have been put behind bars. I but he mean, admitted he guilt. Special. He ended up admitting guilt because I agreed to the plea agreement. And he said, you know, he asked for no jail time. And so he got away with 10 years of probation was his sentence. And, you know, he became a registered predatory offender. But I entered that guilty plea or that plea agreement to obtain his confession of guilt. 
especially when I had friends or former friends that didn't believe me. And yet they never spent five minutes to even listen to my side of the story. Wow. If we want to be a church that, yes. If we want to be a church that cares about victims, we have a long way to go. Yeah, but um, at this point, at this point, I'm concerned um, less about my own betrayal and more about protecting Holy Mother Church from mm. predators and those who protect them, whether it be because of blackmail or because of um, involvement in similar networks. Um, I'm very concerned about a number of um, these priests still in active ministry who have yet to issue public statements um, denouncing the satanic ritual abuse that I underwent and denouncing Jacob Bertrand, who's no longer even a priest, let alone, I don't even think he's a practicing Catholic. So it shouldn't be so hard for these priests to issue a statement um, and clear their names. I'm thinking of Marco Rupnik right now, Rachel. I got Marco Rupnik in my mind. Father, Father Marco Rupnik, who, who, by the way, is still listed as a Jesuit and an active priest in good standing in the directory that just came out, right? So there's that. Uh, Bishop Strickland, you know, he got the he got the uh, Vatican uh, visitation treatment. So did the bishop in Puerto Rico, and many many others got that treatment as well. But not Father Marco Rupnik, who had a order of women whom he molested and manipulated and injured psychologically, emotionally, and physically for years, Rachel. So it doesn't seem like that big of a stretch to say, yeah, I can see this as a problem, don't you think? Oh, yes, absolutely. And when more of these details do emerge, it allows those of us, like myself, who actually was a victim of very similar um, ritualistic formulas that Rutnick had himself engaged in. Uh, it's, it's like I was able to say, aha, I've heard of that before. You know, my exorcist told me that that specific thing likely was done to me too. Um, if you read some of the reports, for instance, Rutnick forced nuns to, um, I, I don't even want to talk about it. It's just horrific, but it's in the news. Um, he forced them to drink his seminal fluids through a chalice. And uh, it's from the pits of hell. It's just from the pits of hell. But these types of ritualistic formulas are kind of the types of things um, that, that occur in these rituals. Uh, and so exorcists, those um, who are involved in, um, you know, work helping victims such as myself we can kind of start to find patterns and to recognize well these guys um in these networks uh have playbooks they're actually following ritualistic play playbooks these are organizations satanic organizations has your life it's because this has been years 2010 it's 14 years is that enough time do you still struggle what is that what is your life like now, th- these many years past? Praise be Jesus Christ. Um, and honestly, I have to just honor the Blessed Virgin Mary because she uh, has been central every step of the way. And then, of course, culminating in that total liberation um, after 10 months of excruciating spiritual combat where we did deal with manifestations with these occult demons and witchcraft demons. It was Our Lady who crushed the head of Satan. Amen. And I'll never forget that final day, that final hour on um, the, the solemnity of the Assumption where she literally crushed the head of the final demon. And um, truly, uh, she has been central in my total liberation and in my healing. And um, she has actually sent good priests, Amen. sons, of her immaculate heart to have been so central in my recovery. You know, I'm not against the priesthood. If anything, I am so wholeheartedly for it. I I want to hold it to a higher, to the standard, you know? Um, I want our priests to, yes. I I just want to shine a light on this because I love the priesthood and I love the church so much. Yeah, I think sometimes folks, can get the wrong impression that maybe I, I I hate the Catholic Church because of how much I like call out all of these horrible <laughs> stories. 
But that's no, it's out of love for for Holy Mother Church. You know, I, I have that saying I like to say is we have to turn the light of Christ on so the cockroaches don't think they own the kitchen, right? Like, right. I, I, I was listening to that interview you did with jo- Dr. Jennifer Roback Morris. Again, good interview. We're going to link to it. Um, and she, she had a statement mm-hmm. that resonated with me at the beginning of that. She was setting up the conversation. She was talking about, hey, listen. Other people who've interviewed Rachel have sort of focused on the hierarchy, what they did or didn't do, or, you know, the Cardinal McElroy angle. Hey, listen, Cardinal Mm -hmm. McElroy knew, and he chose to hide it. He chose to move on and pretend like it wasn't a thing. That's an issue. But that's also, by their fruit, you shall know them, right? Let's let that sink in. Mm -hmm. But then Dr. Jennifer said, listen, we don't presume to be able to to think that we're going to correct the the, the hierarchy of the church. And I agree with this. I, I'm on board with that. I, I I resonate with that because I don't think anything I do is going to correct the hierarchy of the church. But that doesn't mean you don't have an obligation to speak out, right? right. Like you knew and you didn't say anything. Hmm. Like right. that's a different. Like I, nope. I'm sorry. I'm gonna I'm gonna call it and uh, let God determine the outcome of it. But uh, we can't, I can't determine, I can't change what comes out of the Vatican or hierarchs or what happens at the knack or doesn't, you know, I can't, I have no power to do any of those things, but I do have an obligation. I was given a microphone in a public pulpit. I'm supposed to do something uh, with that. And I have to be, I have to be answerable to that. So I feel like we have to call this stuff out. Let, let the chips fall where they may, but it's out of love. And I like the way you said that. How hard was um, going from, from all of that background, all of that abuse, all that recovery to married life. Yeah, I married, um, I was going to say a saint, but I know him really well. <laughs> <laughs> he's, a, he's, a, he's on his way. He's on his way. And um, Let me guess, you're making him a saint. I got it. I got it. <laughs> he has laid down his life for me Amen. every step of the way. And if it weren't for my marriage... I don't think I'd be alive. Um, My husband saved me. And um, of course, you know, he's been in the background silently, kind of like St. Joseph, supporting me as I have um, gone through the criminal procedure, taken my abuser to court. Um, He's just been there every step of the way. And um, praise be to God. We live a beautiful. Oh, we live a beautiful life outside of all of this. But yes, I am a trauma survivor. He has had to be very patient with me as I have recovered. It's been a long road. And I'm, I'm still recovering. It's a long road. Um, but I, I would like to believe that I am the strongest right now than I've ever been. You know, and, and throughout our marriage, we've discovered tradition. We've returned to tradition, we love the Latin mass, we're raising our children as traditional Catholics. And um, we just, you know, we, we're a family that just loves Jesus Christ as King and Mary as Queen. And we're just an ordinary Catholic family trying to figure it out and take it one day at a time. Yeah, praise be to God. Do you, you have young children, do you are you yes. at all concerned about how your young children might find out about your past? Or I'm sure you've thought mm-hmm. about that. I know I have thought about it even in relation to my own past. So maybe can you speak to that a little bit? You know, it's funny. I was literally thinking about that last night as I snuggled my little girl. Mm. How am I going to tell her? And I think that I'm going to rely on the Holy Spirit, listen to my husband, and we will slowly and in stages introduce this to her in a way that she can comprehend. I don't want her to discover these things about her mom in the news, you know? Um, And so we are a very transparent family, a very open family. Um, But of course, there needs to be prudence. And um, I think because of the, the type of grooming that I experienced, I'm already going to be very cautious and I'm going to be instructive and teach my children certain things about um, boundaries and even just giving information to people like, had I known that this type of abuse existed, I never would have confided in, um, in this cleric that I was a virgin. Now I had come from Steubenville, for instance, 
And you talk about all these things. And in, in my mind, I was giving glory to God and saying, look at how God had preserved me. And, you know, I was sharing this in a very spiritual setting where I thought we were having a holy conversation. But now I know that piece of information was crucial to his predation. And so I want to teach my daughter to um, keep things very close to her heart and to be able to recognize signs of... Um, you know, a grooming and to always have an open relationship of dialogue with me and her father. So I guess all of this has been very instructive for me because now I know how predators work before, during, and after their, um, their assaults. You know, divine providence was at work in a particular way in my case. You know, my husband, and, and maybe we need to just have another discussion sometime about all this because it's a fascinating story how it all played itself out. But I met my husband in Rome in 2009. Wow. On Thanksgiving night. Yes, he was in seminary. And so this, this story is, is pretty unique. In fact, I'm writing about it now and hoping to come forward and explain a little more, shed a little bit more light, and um, honestly just share from my heart uh, my vocation story and... Um, some of the different complexities that were happening throughout Rome. But mm. knowing that my husband was always there, he knew my heart before, during, and after the abuse. He's been able to see truth. You know, whereas my, my abuser was um, obviously weaponizing truth for these satanic ends. But I have, um, I have a husband who I can trust. And it was always kept um, my mind right, you know? And um, it, it was a very crucial, I mean, it was a devastating and hellish process of unwinding from the mind control. I, mean, I cannot even, that was a taste of hell on earth, like in the very beginning couple of years of actually facing this, because I was running toward the convent. I was going to enter religious life, in fact, it was the only thing that made sense to me in the aftermath of my abuse. After all, I'm a bride of Christ. I had Amen. to keep telling myself this. I had to keep these secrets. In fact, facing them was near impossible because if I faced the truth, I had to admit that I was duped and that this was evil. And then in time, I had to admit that this is satanic. Yeah. And um, now I know and can say through a very long process of grooming and deliverance, or excuse me, of healing and deliverance, now I can say I was being groomed um, for something truly horrible. And I can speak to it with boldness and confidence. And, and um, it's, it's, it's not about me anymore. You see, I've been, I've yeah. been vindicated to some degree, but now I speak for others. Knowing that this is something that is happening, there is a systematic, um, some systematic predation going on and attacks against particularly religious sisters. I feel called to be a voice for the voiceless and to um, do everything in my power to reach those women who might be caught or trapped in the life that I was able to escape if that makes sense. You know, so yeah. God has made, brought good things out of this horror. He's brought evil out of, out of this, and, or he's brought goodness out of the evil and, and yeah. um, turned it all around and exposed the devil. And now yeah. we're, um, we're just working for the kingdom of light and I wanna do everything I, I can for souls. So um, the ritual rapes occurred in the summer of 2010 and my exorcist has helped me to believe that that was still a grooming process for the legitimate satanic black mass. And had that happened, um, well, my virginity would have been solemnly consecrated to Satan. And I likely would have been, I would be working on the other side now uh, on, on the kingdom of darkness. But um, these assaults happened in 2010. By 2012, I was running toward religious life. Um, my, my abuser was still trying to establish contact with me. He was making secret wow. plans to come visit our family home. 
over Christmas of 2010. All of this emerged many years later when everything wow. started to come out and then parents started to talk about, oh, well, he was trying to come to our house that Christmas, which would have been over my birthday, which also is significant considering I believe that that third and final mass, that satanic ritual, had he accomplished it on my birthday, well, Satanists do these things on um, the birthdays of their victims. So I believe that, you know, it was probably what he was trying to do. Um, but yes, his predation was ongoing. But by the time it was 2012, I was visiting numerous religious communities. I went to the Carmelites in Alhambra, uh, in Los Angeles, and then the Missionaries of Charity. And I was really running from reality and mm. running from the and um, doing everything in my power to just uh, look, the brain is a powerful thing, <laughs> you know, yeah. it really, really is. And um, it was very difficult for me to face the truth and to disclose uh, the truth about what happened to me. And when I did, I actually thought that um, Rich, my now husband of almost 10 years, this June we will celebrate 10 years. Congratulations. I, I disclosed my abuse to Rich, kind of in an effort to explain to him why I couldn't marry him. And I, I wow. started to talk about secret rituals, thinking that he might understand, thinking God would give him a grace to understand. And I started to describe them kind of like, well, this is the reason why I, I, I can't marry you. I'm sort of in this contract with Christ and you know, and the moment I started to talk about all this, his immediate reaction was, Rachel, that was a satanic black mass. Wow. And he knew, I think because of, I think well, he loves Fulton Sheen. And I think he had learned through Fulton Sheen a little bit more about what happens in the black mass. Anyway, um, I now That's know crazy. after working with, yeah, after working with my exorcist, it actually was more of a dress rehearsal for, for the real thing. But um, when I broke silence with Rich, who eventually would become my husband. Uh, that was when everything started to unwind. And I was so, I mean, I had been in a psychological prison to the nth degree. I was under real mind control. Um, but the this confession to Rich was the beginning of breaking down Bertrand's control over me. And actually, after I confessed and talked about these rituals with Rich, the first thing that I did, because he, I mean, he responded, <laughs> I can't even tell you how he responded. I was, he started sobbing. And I realized, okay, this must be really, really bad. And um, I went from thinking Bertrand is like Padre Pio to like, oh my gosh, Rich just told me this was a satanic black mess. Well, I am so confused, what's reality? The first thing I did was, run and 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 do a a general confession because right. i didn't know i was so confused about what was sin what was not i mean the, the abuse had done such damage to my psyche and um i now know thanks to my exorcist that you know i wasn't even in i wasn't intentionally sin i mean this man when he abused me he had truly convinced me that this was the will of god I wasn't intentionally sinning or, or entering this uh, satanic ritual with any sort of, I mean, I was like a child. I truly believed. With, I, and, and it's difficult. That's been hard to admit that I was I duped. Bet. I bet, yeah. Yeah, you know, but, I can uh, imagine that would be hard. Yes, but that has been sort of the breakdown of Bertrand's control. And after I confessed, um, I never spoke to Bertrand ever again. The, the, the next Praise time that he heard my voice was in criminal court at his sentencing when I gave my victim's impact statement. I kind of want to talk about the good old boy system that we're looking at here. It does feel, it does feel like, you know, it gets labeled as like the lavender mafia. I think they're related personally. I think yes. it's one system. I don't know. Is it? Do you think it's competing systems in the church? There's the the lavender mafia who tried to uh, you know subvert seminaries with homosexuals, and then of course those men become priests and they become cardinals. Some of them become 
some of the, some of them become the fixer for for the Pope. Even McCarrick is who I'm thinking about there. And then all of the cronies, as Bishop Lopes said back in 2018, we all knew. We all knew about Cardinal McCarrick. Yeah, it wasn't a big secret, was it? They all kind of knew. So do you think that there is competing uh, corrupted systems of networks of men in the, in the church, or do you think it's all they're all kind of working hand in glove? If I were to guess, I think that they are working together. I think that the Lavender Mafia is involved in the occult and some of these groups. I think so, at least some of the Lavender Mafia. I think that there's a lot of overlap. But what I will say is I also think that those who are living sexually immoral lives, double lives in the priesthood, are blackmailable. And predators such as mine figure out which clerics they can control through blackmail. That's what I think also may have been going on potentially in my situation as far as those priests who, you know, covered for, protected my abuser. It's kind of like, well, are you involved or were you blackmailed? What's going on here? You know, but I do think that there's a lot of overlap and um, you do find a lot of occultism within the um, homosexual community as well. And so uh, I think that the Lavender Mafia, um, I mean, let's just think about Cardinal Bernadine, for instance, if you know, you know, what he was involved with, what he was promoting and his um, satanic ritual abuse of Agnes as you know, disclosed and um, or spoken about by Malachi Martin, you know, there's, like you said, this is the tip of the iceberg. There's still more to the story that you haven't shared. Like there's still, there's still another, there's like a part two. So I had two questions. One, can you give us a hint? Like what, what, what could more be? What, what, what does this next phase of you speaking out publicly? What is that about? What does it mean? What does it look like? Number one, number two is, um, what about a book? Uh, I had you, I remember you when I, I reached out to you originally like two, two years ago or something, you mentioned that you were in the process of writing a book. How is that going? So maybe you can speak to those. Well, yes. First, I am breaking silence again um, because I know now that this really truly is a systemic issue. My case is a window into something that is happening, particularly to, according to the occult expert, religious sisters. So I am choosing to break silence again and um, begin to talk about this because I think Catholics out there think, oh, that Rachel Master Giacomo story, that is just some crazy, like you said, isolated incident that never happens. Um, You know, and I I don't think people are doubtful of it. I mean, I'm standing on a criminal conviction. Um, I think, think, if anything, they just don't really want to acknowledge it. They'd rather... Fear no evil, see no evil, and look the other way. But I don't think anyone's doubting my story. I think that our Lord has allowed me to um, go through this whole process and get that conviction and have the, um, you know, the validation of the criminal court system. Uh, I think he's allowed that for a reason. And now, you know, he's put this fire in my heart to speak out for the sake of others. And, um, And so I'm doing so no longer for myself, but really for um, renewal in the church, re- church reform. Um, and again, I, I, I love to share our story of how we really found tradition in the midst of all of this. And um, mm-hmm. Catholics really need to wake up about the, the reality that our church has been infiltrated by her enemies. And um, so my story helps to wake people up and at the end of the day, I really want to do all that I can for the victims. Amen. Uh, yeah. And then also, yes, I'm writing a book. I am writing a book. Um, it has been a very slow process, but it is still underway. And I'm very hopeful that um, it'll, it'll come out soon. I've got all the right people involved. And um, it's, I think it's going to be... Um, a wonderful gift to the church. At least I hope so. And, and it's, I'm still debating on the name. I would love um, some feedback, but it's actually still Catholic. The name still Catholic. How I overcame 
the forces of darkness to defend the one true faith. What I really want to impart is that if someone like me who has experienced, I mean, the, the, the heart of this evil that has infiltrated the Catholic Church, I've experienced it firsthand. You know, I didn't get so sucked in fully, but I came face to face with it and I got burned by it pretty bad. Someone like me can stay Catholic. Anybody can. Yeah. Anybody can stay Catholic. I don't want my story to scandalize and cause the sheep to scatter and to run, but rather I want to say, look, I am unafraid to acknowledge the elephant in the room. There is a crisis. Our church has been infiltrated by our enemies, but most priests are good. And, you know, this, this small amount of Judas priests do exist, and we need to, we need to uh, drive them out of Holy Mother Church. And the church does need the laity to rise up and to remind our priests to be priests, our bishops to be bishops. And so that's the work that I'm about. That's the work that I'm about, rising up yeah, as a laywoman and using my, my voice in whatever way I can to remind our priests to be priests and our bishops to be bishops. So I want to talk, I just want to tease this for a sec, because there's a lot of information you've been working with journalists and reporters are we talking the tip and underneath is a giant iceberg or what are we talking about i don't know to the degree that this underbelly exists but i think it's probably pretty big and i just want to pull on this little string because yeah. i think that the more that we pull on this little string it's going to start to unwind um networks and things like that so yes we are investigating certain people um Many investigators have been involved over the years. And at this point, I think I'm prepared to start naming people and hopefully start to discuss in greater detail some of the particulars pertaining to my own case so that victims can find the courage to come forward and that we can start to unveil this thing. Some, it needs to break. It needs to break open. Amen. God love you, Rachel. Thanks for being on. Did you like that video? It's okay. You can admit it. It's perfectly fine. Hey, we cover the big stories of our day from inside the church to outside the church to all points in between. And we do it from a Catholic perspective. It's called a Catholic take. It's a radio program Monday through Friday. We live stream it right here on this channel, by the way. So make sure to subscribe, like, and share. We would be very grateful to you. And don't forget, you're going to want to watch this video right here because you don't want to miss anything.